monument is on a rock that is 33 million years old. For the last 10,000 years, indigenous people have lived and moved throughout this area, raising families for 400 generations. The monument is part of America's public lands. It's known as the National Conservation Lands, and it is managed by the Bureau of Lands Management within the Department of the Interior, now headed by U.S. Secretary and Interior of the Interior, Deb Halen, that we are all thrilled, the first Native American and an enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo tribes. The Friends of the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument recognize that our communities can take better care of our public lands if we become aware and learn and understand our connections with our history, culture, and the land. So just a few notes about the process tonight. It is a webinar platform, so our more than 400 attendees, videos will not be visible to the speakers or each other. Um, however, we welcome you to begin uh, some interconnectedness by just mentioning in the chat box where you're watching from this evening. Uh, we've had attendees from all over the country and everybody is welcome. We are not gonna do questions and answers during the lecture. We'll do it right after the keynote speaker, but that should not stop you from entering questions into the chat box that we will read and respond to at the end of this evening. There'll be one new little short lecture uh, so survey that's gonna pop up. It's just four questions. It take you five minutes. Help us understand what you'd like to hear more about as we continue to build our lecture series, Inspiring Connections with Nature. So yeah, see, we can see now Puerto Rico. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm really honored to, I'm gonna get right moving forward and introduce our first of the Native American representatives tonight, Ms. Stassi, Stassi Maxwell, and she is on the board of directors of the Friends of the Monument. She is also co-chair of the Native American Student Union at Southern Oregon University. She is an active member who serves as a liaison between the Friends and the National Conservation Lands Foundation, and she is continually deepened her respect and affection for the biodiversity, the interconnectedness of this land and its inhabitants. She's an SOU alumna, and she hopes to unite her passion with action by bridging connections between education, health and wellness, herbal medicine, and the wisdom of the indigenous peoples in relation to the monument. Welcome, Ms. Maxwell. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stasi. Um, as a board member for Friends of the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument, I would like to start this program with a land acknowledgement. Um, acknowledgement is recognizing the indigenous people who were forcibly removed from this land. There are many histories of this land and many people that have resided here, including the Klamath tribes, Confederated tribes of Grand Ron, Confederated tribes of Siletz, Cow Creek, Coquille, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Shasta, and Quartz Valley Rancheria. If I missed anyone, my apologies. I'm still learning myself the history of this land. Um, there is so much more to learn. I'm happy you're all here today. And may we all be humble and be willing to learn together and to build relationships and service to this land. Um, it is my great honor and privilege to um, introduce Dr. David West. He is Director Emeritus of the Native American Studies Program. He holds an MA in Community Psychology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, 1990. He has a BA in Sociology from the University of Oregon, 1981, and he's an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Uh, David was the Native American Studies Coordinator at Southern Oregon University until his retirement in 2015. Uh, he taught the core courses in Native American Studies at Southern Oregon University, offering insight into both the historical perspectives as well as contemporary Native American issues. His advocacy efforts for Native American Indian education in Oregon is evidenced by the success of Conway Nicotillicum, for which he is a co-founder and director. Uh, Conway Nicotillicum is a residential Native American Youth Summer Academy held on the, on the university campus. This academy is a standalone unique model program in Oregon and the West Coast. David is a member of the Oregon Indian Education Association, the National Indian Education Association, 
the National Congress of American Indians and serves as the institutional representative for the Southern region with the Oregon Indian Coalition on Post-Secondary Education. David? Thank you. Bonjour, Nakam. Ani nanizhi wik. Baba skiba nish chostana nandak splish. Nishnabe, nishnabe, borawadme. Miami, Chikapu. I come from the areas of the Kankakee and Wabash rivers in the Great Lakes area. And I said to you, hello, my relatives. How are you this afternoon? I'm pleased to be with you. My name is White Like Old Eagle. My brother, I found you who likes to go new places to sing and dance for a good time. I come from the Anishinaabe people and the um, Potawatomi, citizen Potawatomi nation with Miami and Kickapoo descendancies. We come from the area of the Wabash and Kankakee rivers in Northern uh, Illinois and Indiana on the Eastern side of Lake Michigan and in the area around Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David G. Lewis to you today. I was born in Oregon and the only Potawatomi people that I knew growing up were my mother and my grandfather. But the native people of Oregon adopted me and took me in and treated me as one of their own in that extended family concept of our indigenous nations. I am grateful to have had the opportunity to work in the areas of Indian education, community psychology, uh, corrections, and alcohol and drug intervention prevention in the national sobriety movement for Native American people. My crowning achievement for myself as a Native educator is the Conaway Nakatilikum Native Youth Academy that Stasi mentioned, who Stasi is also a graduate of Conaway Nakatilikum. We are going into what will be our 27th or 28th year, uh, given the uh, virtual academy this last year during COVID. There isn't another program like this one anywhere in the nation. And for it to have been in existence uh, 27 to 28 years as an early intervention and retention program and uh, collegiate uh, experience is unparalleled. I'm so proud of the number of students that we've had graduate from this program and graduate from their respective schools and go into college and universities. We have many advanced degrees amongst the attendees over that many years. And uh, I'm very thankful to all of the staff and the people who have worked on that very wonderful academic endeavor that helped to bring life back into a land where the essence and the spirit of the living people had been removed from the time of 1855 and the gold rushes and colonization in its fullest impact. So today, I am looking so much forward to hearing this gentleman's presentation on the history of this region that I was born and raised in, the one that I've worked in, and the one that I have many members of my family uh, who are interred in this land here and living amongst the people. Uh, that now are at Grand Ronde and Solettes, and it's my privilege to be here with you today. I'd like to introduce Dr. David G. Lewis, PhD, who is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. He is a descendant of the Tacoma, Chinook, Molala, and Santiam Kalapuya peoples of Western Oregon. David has engaged in research on the tribal histories of the Northwest coastal peoples, specializing in the Western Oregon tribes. David served as the director of the Southwest Oregon Project Collection at the University of Oregon and was the cultural department manager of the Grand Ronde tribe for eight years. David's PhD is in anthropology from the University of Oregon 2009 and teaches full time in anthropology and native studies at Oregon State University. David's research essays about the histories of the tribes are published on the blog site um, and that will be provided for you. David lives in Salem with his wife, Donna, and sons, Inate and Sahali. Please welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. David G. Lewis. Thanks, uh, thanks David. Thanks, Tassie. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, it's a great honor to be here. I've never been before as a large audience. We're now 436 people 
that's pretty big. Um, that's a very large audience. I hope I do well here. Um, uh, uh, thanks for the, I, I've known David West for a good number of years. Um, since he uh, attended U of O, he would come there and, and be the, the the arena director of the powwow many times. And, and, and I got to know him and I know his son who came to U of O as well. And so um, I have great respect for him and, and a great program he ran down here in Southern Oregon. Um, and thanks to uh, the organization for inviting me. Um, I've done a few presentations down here in this area, uh, but you know, mainly associated with, with Southern Oregon University, but uh, nothing um, this big. Um, and so I hope I do justice to the people here. Um, I am descendant of these peoples, uh, the, the, the Tequila peoples of this, this land. Um, I, uh, my family came, uh, uh, is the story of the, the woman who was caught in a, uh, a beaver dam and hid there in a beaver dam while uh, while the people were being removed from Southern Oregon up to the Grand Ron Indian Reservation. And uh, um, and she walked by herself as a child all the way to the Grand Ron Reservation to, to see her people again. And so I'm a descendant of that, that lady who came uh, uh, more than 170 years ago now to, um, to Grand Ron to, to see her people again. And, and so uh, uh, the tribe now regularly uh, goes down back into the Tecalma area and uh, uh, participates in all kinds of activities down there. So let me get started on my presentation here. I gotta share my screen. So let, let's make sure that technically works and stuff. Uh, let's see. All right, so hope you can all see my screen here. All right, so um, I, I, I kind of named my presentation after the Tequilma people, which are the original name were Dagelma. Uh, they are a culture and a people that live very long time in this period, in this area, probably more than 10 years, 10,000 years. But I will be also addressing some of the Umqua Basin as well. Let me, let me just start here. So here's the area we're kind of looking at today, uh, the Rogue River and Umpqua Basin region. Um, uh, this is a map I created myself, so don't, don't assume the lines are perfect. They're not. Um, there are no actual lines and travel maps. We, we basically just lived in areas and owned certain places, and then everything else was kind of common ownership. Um, but this is, these are the general areas of where the Rogue River tribes lived. Um, the original tribe, Rogue River tribe, were the Tacoma, tri Tacoma peoples. And then their neighbors to the north, the Cow Creeks, or, um, and the people at uh, uh, Grants Pass were also uh, Tacoma speakers. Um, and then there is uh, overlapping history with the Umpqua Basin. Uh, and then people to the south, um, the Shastas, were another people they, in, they worked with, uh, worked around, and perhaps were not as friendly with. Uh, who, who, who may have lived up into the Ashland area, um, but uh, the Kelmas um, in ethnographic notes say that was always our area. So uh, that there will always be this conflict there, I, I think. But uh, let's get into other subjects here. So we have some notes from anthropologists. Um, one, one was from, uh, I believe this is uh, Dorsey says probable that the Tequilma were once the occupants of a territory larger than that they occupied and that later on there was an invasion of the Athabascans who established villages on all sides of them and imposed Athabascan names on Tequilma villages, though they, they never succeeded in forcing Tequilmans to uh, abandon the language. So that's one perspective on the area that was kind of pushed, up, pushed back upon by, uh, by uh, by linguist um, Edward Sapir, who said, you know, there are probably numerous names uh, to various villages from different perspectives or tribal perspectives. So that's the same thing that's going to go for many, uh, you know, place names for mountains and rivers and stuff like that. There, there's going to be numerous names from different tribes in the area, different perspectives on who owned what 
on the, the resources used in what area. Um, we also know that the Tekelmans uh, peoples were uh, uh, thought to be distant relatives of, of the Kalapuyans. Um, there are many, many similar words in both languages, the, the Tekelma and the Kalapuya language. And, uh, and so while it hasn't been sort of proven, um, uh, the Kalapuyans are also one of the older tribes in the area. And so there seems to be uh, some relationship there. Um, so uh, we do have stories from the Athabascans, uh, going back to that subject about, um, about them immigrating from the north in canoes and landing at, at a place uh, in Northern California. So we do have those stories. We don't have similar stories that I know that I know of from um, the Tekelmans who who basically held out that they have always been here. <clears throat> so essentially, the Tekelmans occupied the River Basin, um, the the Cascades and foothills. The Tekelman peoples were called Tekelmans. The people who lived along the Rogue River were uh, or was also called the Gelm. Uh, the Gelum uh, was the, called the, the was the name of the river, and spoke a language that's called now Phoenician. During the 1850s, due uh, due to actions by settlers, miners, and ranchers, the Kelma peoples, along with the neighbors, uh, the, the Athabascan-speaking tribes, the Shasta-speaking peoples, uh, they all confederated together to fight against the Americans, mainly what they call the white men. Uh, this confederation of tribes became known as the Rogue River Indian Tribes, or I call them the Rogue River Confederation. Um, and uh, these people uh, fought to get their land back. Many tribal members today uh, associate uh, Rogue River for their tribal identity. Um, Grand Ron people will say, well, I'm from the Rogue, Rogue River. Um, um, but that, to most people, that means the Confederacy uh, following the war. But for us, it means the Tekelmas, the actual Tekelma people. The Cow Creek Umpqua peoples, also know that the Tekelma, uh, Tekelma speakers were part of this confederacy as well. They were known to be, or thought to be a violent tribe and they actually joined the, um, the confederacy. And there is a, this possibility of other uh, villages that are farther distant from these, the, from main, the main areas in Cow Creek, uh, Grants Pass and uh, um, the, the Rogue River Basin. Uh, Looking Glass Creek is a possible area where there are, were villages as well uh, to the north and then to the south. Um, as far as the Illinois River, there may have been a village as well too. So they were pretty extensive peoples that were interlaced in many ways with both the Shasta peoples and the Athabascan speakers. So we have um, some information about the different bands of the Tekelmas. Um, unfortunately, by the time information was taken from um, a few people by anthropologists, um, uh, there are only a, a, about less than half a dozen that knew anything about their language and knew anything about place names. Um, so these are, the, these are the nature of the notes. These are mainly from um, Harrington, J.P. Harrington. He, he collected many, many notes or several reels of, uh, um, of uh, you know, many, many, hundred, many thousands of notes actually on the Tekelma peoples. Um, uh, and I'll go over some of that of, of where these things may uh, exist. So I put together a map today because um, I thought it'd be more better to see a map. Again, these, these lines are not perfect. Um, they're just an approximation based on the descriptions, uh, which kind of, match exactly what's what's talked about in the books as well. Um, there were there was the main Tekelma area, which is kind of central to the valley and included the Table Rocks. Uh, there was the Latgawa people who were south of the valley and somewhat to the east. Um, there was the Hanisak area to the north or uh, to the north of the Table Rocks. There were the uh, Jacksonville people they're called or Tikalaya people um, in the Jacksonville area. And there were other people up in the Cow Creek Basin, like I said. There were another tribe at, in, uh, at um, Grants Pass. Um, and there's possibility of a village at um, in Looking Glass above. I don't know the names of these villages. Um, some of these things are not collected. They're just, they're just uh, noted as being possibilities. 
Uh, first off, about a little about their culture. The Tacomans, you know, hunted and fished like many other tribes uh, and gathered root crops and berries um, in, in the region. The, their environment was sort of, uh, was, was perfect for hunting and, and they prepared that for hunting by hunting, fishing, and gathering by, you know, setting fires to their lands when they need to and, uh, and doing this on a regular basis. Um, um, what's interesting is that uh, this is one of the few places where there's salmon runs are so far inland in, in an upland area, um, which is rather interesting for a tribe. Many tribes that have still have fishing, like salmon fishing that come from the ocean, um, are, are in a little bit lower lying areas. Um, acorn gathering was a big part of the, the hills. Uh, and um, this is part of the acorn belt that comes up from California, from Southern California, all through Oregon, up into the lower Washington area. And so acorn gathering, acorn was a, acorn woman was a big figure in their uh, tribal um, uh, mythology. Um, doll doll is their major, uh, you know, figure um, that um, um, the, the dragonfly woman who who um, who was a transformer in the area, um, and there are um, some information online which can offer some additional information. Like there's a great newsletter, the Talent Historical Society, that has some really great information as well. If you want to look that up, I don't have the website right here. I just have it linked on here, so in case I wanted to go there. Let's see. Um, I, I teach uh, classes at uh, OSU, as, as has been said. Um, and this is a, um, a season around map that was produced by one of my students this like last week. Um, and she, uh, she drew all of her own drawings and, and uh, the season around is, is, is what we understand is, is how they moved around their land, uh, how the peoples moved around the land and hunted and fished and gathered in the right season of when these things were, were available. When, when foods are available and much of it followed a plant cycle of when things are ripe. And so um, these are some of the resources that are mentioned in many of the stories about, uh, about the Tacoma peoples, uh, different kinds of salmon, steelhead trout, uh, coho salmon, and things like yellow jackets and grasshoppers and camas, tarweed, uh, madrone, acorns, you know, and this student did a really great job on, uh, you know, the the drawings here. I, I I could not have done done anywhere near as close a good job as as they did here. They have wild plums, bear grass, willows for making baskets, um, deer, dogbane for um, for making fiber, and nettle for fiber and for um, other things, and hazels. So everything is is here, and so. Uh, so you can see there were a lot of resources in the area. That's, it's pretty common. It, it's pretty amazing that so many resources in, in this area, they didn't need anything like agriculture. They didn't have agriculture, they didn't need it because the, the wild land produced so much food for them. They, there was no need for any other kind of technology like, like agriculture. I found um, some interesting stories in, 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 in my looking at some of the oral histories. And um, I had to throw an interesting picture of a pocket grofer on here because um, I, I liked it. It was uh, very, very vicious looking. Um, but the Kelmans were known to have um, robbed the, the, the burrows of underground nests of these pocket gophers in the valley because the pocket gophers were really good at digging underground and, and digging up uh, bulbs and tubers and then, and then securing them in uh, in their nests, and so the the tribes knew this and would raid the, these nests for, you know, they can get a whole meal out of um, raiding a nest of a pocket gopher. And so, um, camas is a pretty big deal in most of the valleys, most of the prairies of of Oregon. And uh, yeah, and uh, I've noticed that the camas is a little bit more washed out in the upland areas than the lowland areas. We have a very purple very deep purple uh, camas in the Lamp Valley, whereas up in the um, upland areas around, you know, 2,000 feet or so, the camas comes out more violet or a light blue sometimes. And some of the stories talk about um, there being areas of camas, like a button camas that was very small, and another camas, an area camas across uh, the 
Rogue River um, was a red camas, and I'm not sure if that exists anymore in the Rogue River Valley. I've never heard of anybody seeing a red camas. I, I looked at, I tried to look it up, and I couldn't find anybody that mentioned a red camas in the area. But if there is that that variety, please send me a picture because I'd like to see that and see, know where it still grows. But camas is a major food crop in the area for all the tribes. Um, Acorn um, savannas, uh, oak savannas, acorn groves are important food crops again. Um, it, it, it really begins in Southern California, moves all the way up through the Central Valleys, even the coastal areas of California, and then through the, mainly through the Center Valleys in Oregon, um, somewhat in the coast range, but mostly there are, uh, you know, the River Valley, the Umpqua Valley, the Lamp Valley, all have major acorn groves uh, where people gathered acorns as a food source in the, in, the, in the late summer, grind them up, you know, leach out the tannins, grind them up, and turn them into a, a gruel they call mush uh, for uh, at the end of the summer. And so these, these, these kind of things would store easily through the wintertime and you can make food out of them any time. Um, I haven't heard uh, any stories of this, but other, other tribes have uh, um, actually raided um, areas call, uh, like uh, squirrel's nests and uh, acorn trees. Um, they're called woodpecker trees sometimes, where there's many, many acorns planted into the tree by woodpeckers and other birds. Uh, and, and Native people would raid these things for acorns if when they were starving uh, because they, uh, they knew the plants, I mean, the, the, the birds are really diligent at, at planting acorns in there every year. And there is a, a big acorn tree near Table Rock. Um, and there's, there's a park near Table Rock that has a big acorn tree right there. And so um, I know that exists in the area too. Incidentally, the word for acorn in Tacoma is yana. So there you go. In the higher mountains, there would be berry camps. Um, certain times of the year in their season around, they would go up and they would pick berries, uh, you know, huckleberries, um, salmon berries, all different kinds of blueberries up in the up in the upland areas, um, and the, this is a summertime activity um, where uh, the berries would either be eaten on the spot or brought down and dried out uh, for wintertime use as well. So storage of food through the wintertime was very important for tribes in the area because the winters can be very harsh, could be very harsh, and the tribes really knew they needed to survive by by storing up food um, through the wintertime. Incidentally, this is a uh, uh, called a berry basket. They would be made uh, out of bark in the, in the mountains, um, and very simply by folding the bark together with a pleat at the, on the bottom. And you could actually sew it up both sides and make a little berry basket that, you, that would be used probably once or twice and then thrown away. Uh, it's kind of a throwaway basket for, uh, for the time period. Hazelnuts are also big, uh, different nut plants, I mainly hazelnuts were big in the area, the lots of wild hazels, uh, important crop for, um, you know, nuts uh, preserve really well, so you can actually dry them out and then save them through the winter time or eat them on the spot. Um, they can become parts of, of soups and stews and stuff like that. And, uh, and hazel switches are also used for making baskets. So it was a well-used plant for all kinds of activities. And then we have the different types of salmon. There, um, like I said, it's pretty amazing that, that this is this really high upland valley. Uh, we still had many types of salmon that came all the way up into these high regions. And here are some of the Tacoma names for these salmons. There's a Tomha, uh, which is a spring Chinook salmon, a Peiwi, which is a short and chunky salmon that ran in the rogue, an Alk, uh, a silver salmon that came in October. Yules, uh, which is a steelhead, um, dum hum, uh, dog salmon, tequi, uh, salmon trout, and yukon, which is trout. So lots of different, lots of different types of names for different kinds of salmon that, that were on the rogue and uh, neighboring streams like the, like the Alpagate and places like that. And the tribes were well known for traveling to these places for uh, fishing. Um, there did not seem to be the same kind of ownership over uh, fishing areas 
that we see for other areas, um, like in the Northern tribes for like the Ch like Chinooks, for example, they had ownership over fishing falls, things like that. Uh, there do not seem to be a similar suggestion that, that there was ownership over uh, fishing areas in this area. There was there were shared areas um, in terms of like uh, the, the Athabascans and the, the Tecumas sharing different rivers for, for fishing and stuff. So, uh, which, which says a lot about um, uh, how you treat your neighbors, even though they're, they're strangers who speak a different language. Um, another uh, a big thing of it with all the tribes in the area is, is the kinship that, that everybody had. Um, lots of people were interrelated. You were always supposed to marry outside your tribe. Um, so example of this is, uh, is to, to come to him, Chief John, who was the leader of the Grand, of the, um, the Rogue River Confederacy. Um, he was much celebrated by the tribes. He's kind of a hero for many of us because he basically fought back against American oppression in our lands. Um, he is uh, a Shasta chief, um, but in various documents, he's been confused as being perhaps Tekelma or Athabascan, uh, but family lore, uh, but family lore and, and records absolutely suggest he was primarily Shasta. He was, uh, his, his tribe was the Shasta tribe. Um, but we do know that people, like I said, we do know the tribes intermarried so it's highly likely that his father was Shasta because that's normally in this area where people went to their father's tribe and the mother was another uh, tribe originally. So he likely then still had then kin relationships with either the Tecumans or Athabas Athabascans. Um, and so when he became principal chief of the tribes in 1855, uh, who led the rebellion against the Americans, um, he probably had a lot of um, uh, I guess, political, you know, uh, influence over other tribes because of his relationships, um, his kin relationships. Uh, so during the war, war he, he attracted many bands to join him because of his power, the way he was speaking. At the, at the Sluts Agency, even, he continued to, to add people tribes um, to return to their traditional lands. And because of that, he was actually arrested. He and his, he and his son were arrested and sent down to the Presidio in San Francisco to live for a number of years uh, for, his, for his actions inciting um, people to leave the reservation. And then when he was released, he went back, he went to Grand Ronde and lived with his sister for the rest of his life. He was at Grand Ronde, he was called Tai John for, um, uh, until he died. And so he was seen to be, you know, sometimes called Old John or Chief John or Tai John or, or John Taiyi sometimes in some records. So well-respected man in his time. Um, I want to show a little bit about the overlapping Latgawa Shasta situation. I know there has been a lot of discussion about renaming Dead Indian Road and um, that's, you know, still kind of proceeding as a project in the area. There has been some renaming of some landmarks that are Dead Indian landmarks in the area to Name them Latgawa because uh, the area is was absolutely the the, the land of the Latgawa people. There were Shastas in the area that were coming that were probably migrating up from the south. Um, and if you look on the right hand side here of our screen, we can see this pretty vast Shasta area all the way into California. You know, when I put this map together, I didn't realize how vast their Shasta really area really was, but. And these, and again, these map, these lines are not perfect, but they pretty much show that the area of um, that the Shastas had, you know, five different main tribes, and they owned a pretty large chunk of Northern California, as well as a small chunk of, of Southern Oregon, uh, or lived in that area. And so, uh, um, I know there's um, there's some bands today that are they're working on, uh, you know. Um, making themselves, you know, uh, federally, federally recognized at some point. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that parts of the area of Ashland were probably jointly or commonly owned, as we say. Um, but uh, because there are so many place names in the area that are Lagawa place names that are in our, on our records, we have to assume that the area was pretty well known by Lagawa people. 
and uh, enough so they had place names in the area. So there you go. So um, besides the culture of the tribes, which you know we're still kind of ferreting out of the records and stuff, um, uh, there were numerous movements of peoples into the area um, in sort of the, what I call the settlement area era. Um, in 1830s to 40s, there was trade with Spaniards in California. There, uh, a lot of Americans were coming down to California and trading for cattle, bringing cattle into Oregon and other supplies into the Oregon Territory because that was one of the only sort of outposts of, of white civilization on the West Coast. Uh, Fort Vancouver couldn't give you, give you everything and, and, they, and the Americans thought that, well, the Vancouver, the, the British at the Van, Fort Vancouver was were in too much in control of the trade, so they went to California to get it. And there's a lot of movement back and forth um, down through the Siskiyous as people um, were trying to get supplies for California. Um, uh, post-1844, um, the Oregon Trail began, and then sometime after that, they began the California Trails, uh, uh, immigrations of Americans into the West. Um, these people were drawn by the, the, the attraction of perhaps free land, an opportunity in the West, um, not really caring at all that there were already trial people living here, and and basically they began taking land without being, without any kind of legal, you know, approval. In 1849, there was the California Gold Rush, which 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 drew tens of thousands of, of white men into California to strike it rich, as we all know. By 1850, there was the Oregon Gold Rush which drew uh, you know, thousands of people into Southern Oregon. Um, and then later on, the gold rushes continue up, up into the North, like the Nez Perce area, you know, and finally up into Washington, up, up to Alaska, but that, that continued for several uh, decades, um, and perhaps in some ways still continuing today in Alaska. 1851, um, we have the Battle Rock incident where Captain Titchener and his men, um, uh, wanted to establish a, a, a Port Orford, the new town called Port Orford on the coast, which was really uh, uh, an economic venture on his part to um, to get the, the the Oregon gold miners to trade in his town. And so he, he wanted to sort of make money off the gold miners by offering them services, uh, you know, either a way to a place to sell their gold or, you know, trade it in or um, to buy supplies or perhaps get a meal or um, or, or other services. Um, so that was established uh, under protest by the tribes. The tribes really kind of did not want somebody just settling in their land. And there was never seen to be an opportunity or never, uh, uh, there never was a payment for that, that established a port offer to the tribes, which was absolutely uh, uh, the way that you would do something like this under tribal law. 1849 to, to about 57, uh, American settlers were committing genocide uh, on the tribes on the coast and driving them from away from areas to be settled in order to establish coastal towns uh, to serve the gold miners. This really happened a lot in Northern California, mainly because of the California gold rush and it was happening in, in Southern Oregon with in the Chetco area, Port Horford and other, and other towns and stuff. So movement into, the, into these lands, these tribal lands, caused much unrest on the tribes that were facing loss of land and resources due to white men taking their lands, for, um, uh, taking lands for gold miners, for gold mining or settlement. Nothing was paid to the tribes until at least 1856 when they arrived on, on reservations in, in Northwest Oregon. Um, it, the first uh, treaty came in 1853 that was eventually ratified. So all the time before that, was unpaid. It was uh, unpaid um, taking of, of native lands, taking of native resources, and putting a lot of people into very stressful situations. So for more than 20 years, lands and resources were taken illegally from tribes, no opportunity for any justice to the tribe. In fact, the U.S. court system, uh, the circuit court system, would not hear testimony from tribal people because they could not generally speak English. And there was no attempt by the United States to control the mobs of volunteer militias who, who committed genocide on tribal villages. This is a pretty common uh, activity that was pretty well documented for Northern California and Southern Oregon, uh, where um, the states and the territory would hire militias to control the Indians and their control equated to genocide. 
tribal descendants were never offered the opportunity to remain on their lands, nor were they fairly paid for land in their lifetimes. It wasn't until the 20th century where a good number of Indian claims came through and uh, they were, you know, in part paid for the land, but never, nobody ever has been paid for um, the, the amount of violence that visited these peoples over several decades. Um, conflicts um, kind of were ramping up in the 1840s uh, with settlement, with you know movement through the territory, exploration. Uh, things began became increasingly violent after the 1849 gold, California Gold Rush, 1850 Oregon Gold Rush, and the tribes had to deal with thousands of white prospectors and settlers invading their lands. The tribes were not happy that lands were being invaded, and they were treated very badly by the white men causing attacks, thefts, retribution against the, the Americans and vice versa. There were in this time period, two uh, peace treaties with the Rogue River tribes. These treaties are not normally talked about in terms of when we talk about the seven treaties of Western Oregon. These are two additional treaties that were probably never ratified by Congress, but they were um, created by um, essentially Joseph Lane uh, who was General Joseph Lane. Um, he went down there and he, he negotiated twice with, with, with the uh, Rogue River tribes, tribes on the Rogue River, and, and negotiated these treaties of peace. They were not land transfers or anything. They were just saying that we're not going to, that you're going to keep your, your folks to yourself. You're not going to commit any violence against the United States. Um, the problem always was with the peace treaties is, is, is that the, there was no teeth to them. They did not, there was no way to keep them um, operative uh, because there was never any kind of um, um, any way to hold white men accountable for their actions in a court of law. Uh, if, if, if there was no testimony by, by native people because they could not speak English, there was absolutely no way that white men would be held accountable. Um, during one of these peace treaties, uh, the first one, um, General Joe Lane and Absakar, or Chief Joe, who came, became known as Chief Joe, uh, exchanged names. And so uh, Chief Joe got his name from Joe Lane. And, and he actually very much respected Joe Lane uh, and the way he treated him uh, you know, fairly in the peace treaty process. Um, and so that's why he took the name Chief Joe um, thereafter. Um, and so there are more of these treaties, um, talks about the, there's more essays that address these treaties on my blog site, and I'll post that later for you. But it's, it's at a place called IndianHistoryResearch.com. Uh, I've been writing a good number of essays on various small subjects. I think that I'm up to into the 450s range of essays. Um, so if you want to check them out, they're all on my blog site for free. Um, the last uh, big treaties that, or the first big treaties that were ratified were in 1853. Um, um, there was first a, a treaty of peace. And then two days later uh, on September 10th, Joel Palmer, Palmer first negotiated the treaty of purchase with the Tacoma lands. Um, and in that treaty, he actually established um, Table Rock Re Reservation too, a place that they could stay temporarily until, um, he figured out what to do with them, where he figured out where to put them in, in, in Western Oregon, because uh, essentially all, all of the, the white men wanted all the land and did not want to allow tribal people to stay in their land at all. So we had to find a place that no white white men wanted. And that became eventually the Coast Reservation. Um, and those, uh, I have actually essays about these treaties and their negotiation on my blog as well. Each, every treaty in Western Oregon has an essay. So if you wanna read these things, they're, they're, on my essay, they're on my blog. So the tribe then sold these lands and essentially um, they sold them because they knew there would be continued warfare. Uh, they knew that if they did not sell the land and, and move to a place where they could be protected by the army or by the Indian agent you know, like Joel Palmer, um, they, would, they would eventually uh, there would be continuous war. And so they, they wanted peace, they asked for peace, and they, they actually did go to the reservation and stay there peacefully. Of course, we know that any of you that lived in Southern Oregon know that that didn't happen, um, that there originally was Oregon war, mainly because the white men would not allow people to stay even on the reservation in peace. They kept onto the reservation or attacking Indians on the reservation 
which is the whole reason why the Confederacy um, had to leave the reservation to protect their people. Um, the, the, the third uh, big treaty in Southern Oregon uh, was the, 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 the Treaty of 1854. Um, it was negotiated to allow the Shasta people, or, or not the S Shasta, but the CH Shasta people, Shasta Costa people, onto the reservation. Um, there was the, this treaty, uh, the Shasta Costa Treaty had been signed a little bit ahead of this, and that was with it for a territory just to the west of the Tacoma Territory. And they needed a reservation to go to as well. So Palmer decided since the Table Rock was so large, they could just confederate the tribes together onto one reservation. And so they had to sign a second treaty to allow the, the um, to get an agreement of the Tacomans to allow that the Athabascan peoples mainly onto um, the Table Rock Reserve. And in that treaty process, they also confederated them together as one tribe. So they had, so this was really an intertribal agreement to confederate together as one people, even though they were not always the friendliest people in, in, in the past. So, um, so on the Table Rock, we eventually had Shasta Costa, Tikelmans, various tribes of Tikelmans, and uh, Shasta people from uh, mainly from that Southern Oregon area. Um, there is talk that there were a few Cow Creek people there as well. It may have been the case, or it may have been they were just related to the Cow Creeks as well. Um, so the treaty was created, or this last treaty was created to also remain peaceful. Um, and, and all of the penalties for not remaining peaceful were, were really placed upon the tribe. So um, it was kind of a one-sided treaty in many ways. Um, um, so the tribes did not like how they were treated on the reservation at all. In fact, um, on the reservation in places like Sam's Valley in between the two, um, the rocks, they were, they had agriculture going on. They were, they were making hay and selling that to, to the, to uh, local farmers and stuff. Um, the agent that was in charge of that whole operation at the time, the Indian agent um, was caught by Palmer, uh, basically forcing labor upon the tribes to make money to feed them. And so uh, he eventually had him fired. And I, I believe that conflict uh, about firing that agent, as well as other conflict, uh, conflicts um, eventually got Joel Palmer fired from his job because uh, there were a lot of folks that that um, uh, did not like the tribes and and, and wanted the, the tribes uh, did not want the tribes to stay on reservations safe at all. So okay, so um, I'm not going to deal with the whole Burgervine War. It, it, this could go on for several hours talking about every every single battle. Um, but because of, well, I mentioned the extreme racism that was practiced against the tribes on while they're on peacefully living on the reservation um, and, and the racism equated to uh, a militia from California even coming up into Oregon and attacking a village at Deer Creek and wiping out the people there. Um, there was there and the continued calls for extermination in the US papers and you know the Oregon papers like the Statesman Journal. You know, the Oregonian, there were these letters put out about the need for exterminating uh, natives. Um, the tribes knew this. They knew that they knew how they were being treated, how badly they were being treated by, uh, by the Americans, even though they were trying to live in peace. And they decided, well, you know, maybe uh, that tree doesn't mean anything. Maybe it's worthless. And so well, let's go take our land back. You know, we're not safe on this reservation. Let's leave. And and John and Chief John got all the people he could. He got about five different bands of, of tribes together to join him in the Rogue River Confederacy to leave the reservation and take their land back. And so they fought uh, for about almost a year, a war of kind of complete warfare against any settlers in the area attacking people and driving them and killing them as much as they could to drive them from their land. Um, of course, we know that that didn't completely work they eventually were cornered by the U.S. Army at a place called Big Bend. And uh, they then, at that point, when they realized that the battle was lost after a couple of days, um, 
they said they would not surrender to the militia. They had they went, went instead to surrender to at Port Orford, where they knew the army would protect them. So um, there's a lot of little ins and outs of that of that battle, and I, I recommend reading as much as you can about the battle and and, and realizing that many of the stories about the Korean War not written from a native perspective at all. So they're all written from a non-native perspective. So think about that when you read these things um, that native ideas and native thoughts and, and the and the pressure the native people were under were not are not represented in many of the stories about the reading wars um so because of the war that was raging in southern oregon and another war that was raging on the columbia um palmer joel, Central, uh, superintendent joel palmer had to act quickly in 1856 to remove the tribes from from all regions, he wanted to save them from any further retribution uh, on the part of Americans who sometimes were wanted revenge for killings or for the war themselves. So uh, he set upon his Indian agents to move uh, the tribes to um, a reservation and he had to quickly sort of create this new Grand Ronde Reservation in the Grand Ronde Valley, um, which they bought from a, several, a couple settlers um, and in, in early in 56, from between, uh, January and in March 56, they moved uh, the contents of both Grand, uh, uh, the Table Rock and the Umpqua reservations all the way up to Grand Ron Reservation. In the summertime, after Chief John's band uh, um, lost the battle and, 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 and uh, surrendered at Port Orford, they also moved um, a number, hundreds of native peoples up the coast, um, either through with the schooners or walk them up the coast to the coast reservation or to the Grand Ronde Reservation as well. So in this one year, 1856, Palmer ordered the removal of essentially 4,000 Indians to the two reservations in, 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 in Northern Oregon. Um, on that battle, on that journey, we do have journals from both the rules from the, the Table Rock and from um, the Umpqua Reservation. Umpqua Reservation was first removed. Um, and so I recommend reading the journal accounts because they're pretty interesting in terms of how they're treated by um, by both the Indian agents and, 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 the and the surrounding white populations as they're walking through the areas. But um, on this one trek, which is called the Rogue River Trail of Tears, uh, eight people died and eight babies were born and, and they walked in the dead of winter up to Grand Ronde. So um, it was a pretty long journey and probably the worst time of the year to be doing this journey. When they got to the reservation, um, uh, they had set out a map of where everybody was supposed to be. And uh, it's hard to see on this map, I know, um, but if you look at where there's these little red tent structures on the map, and I happen to get the good map here, this has the color on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, this area over here was where the Klamath were settled. Um, the Malala were settled here. The Tualatin were settled here. This whole center valley was the Kalapuya encampment. The Umqua was settled right here in this area, just south of this river right here. And then the river people were down here on this on this side right here. So they separate all the tribes into separate encampments because uh, they didn't know how they would get along. And as you can tell, there's a good number of tribes on, on this reservation. Um, in total, there was 27 to 35 tribes moved onto the reservation in less than a year. So um, Grand Ron had more than 2,000 people on the reservation at one time. Um, by 1857, um, some of these people were moved on to move to the Sluts Agency, um, you know, over the mountain to the Sluts Agency, but still um, at least 1,500 to, to 1,200 people stayed at Grand Ronde, including a number of people from the Tacoma area, but they were split in half, essentially. So that's what I basically said here um, in this map. Um, this, sh this shows another sort of map of this, where Grand Ron is right here. It's kind of on the edge of the coast reservation, which was set up uh, for 100 miles on the coast here. The problem with the coast reservation at the end, 1857 or 56, is there were actually no, nothing built yet. There was no roads. 
no buildings, no infrastructure at all. So um, what happened is Palmer was fired in around late May, early June, 1856. And he turned around and contracted immediately with uh, Indian, the Indian agency. And he was the one that, that went in with his son and built up the first buildings at the Sluts agency. Uh, so Joel Palmer did that. And he, so he actually, you know, planned out everything at Grand Ron, planned out everything at Sluts, and then actually had got the contract to build the stuff at Sluts as well. By 257, um, they had enough buildings at Sluts and had crops in the ground that they were able to move people from the coast into the, the Sluts reservation and some people from Grand Ron to the Sluts reservation as well. So, uh, so we had then a population of people at Grand Ron, a population of the Sluts Agency by 257, and then there were a few pockets of people that were settled on the coastline where the river estuaries are. And those people later on were the people that uh, never had a ratified treaty with the US government. They, were, they didn't have any um, guaranteed money through treaties, through ratified treaties. So they had to stay on the, uh, on the coast where the best food was, was had and basically feed themselves and clothe themselves for 17 years until they were released. Um, but in these first years, when people, when the rover moves to, uh, to Solets, it's noted in a good number of annual reports that the, that the Rogue Rivers were dying really fast. And I've posited this, this notion that they had been, the Rogue River peoples had been somewhat um, saved from diseases by living in the upland areas um, in, in the Siskiyous and in the uh, Rogue River Valley. They hadn't had as many visitors as, as there had been in the Willamette Valley and other places in California. And so when they were first moved to Grand Ron and then to Silets, suddenly they were exposed to dozens of tribes they'd never seen before and a whole bunch of white people they'd never seen before too. So they were suddenly exposed to all kinds of diseases all at once. So within that first uh, five years, um, probably more than half the tribe died uh, because they were, um, uh, they, they, they caught a number of epidemics, uh, diseases that were not um, they were not at all um, able to survive, uh, didn't have any resistance to it at all. So, um, and this is really um, noted in a number of reports. So I wrote a big, a big article about this. It's called Sickness Issues from the Trumpet, which is a statement that what was made by one of the people at the reservation that they really thought that the trumpets of the, uh, of the military were causing their own, their own sickness. So it's a pretty interesting essay in itself. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the Umpqua Basin because it does figure somewhat into this history. The Umpqua Basin was very complicated as well. Um, there was at least five tribes in the basin. They had the lower Umpqua people who had an isolate language, the upper Umpqua people, which were with an Athabascan language. They had um, the people, the Kalapuyans, the, the Yonkala Kalapuyans. They had Malala people. They had, and they had the Cow Creek. So, there was a lot going on in this basin, um, a lot of diversity of peoples all, work, all living in one basin. I also figured, found out in some of my research recently that these Upper Umpqua peoples were not directly related with all the other Athabascan groups in Southern Oregon. There are stories from the Klatskanai and the Willapa peoples of, of Washington that talks about them um, migrating down to the Klaskanai area and then later on migrating down to past the, the Kalapui area to the Umpqua Basin. And so these stories from these people themselves talk about the, the probability that these Upper Umpqua peoples, the Athabascan speakers, are actually from this northern tribe. They're not at all from the, the southern Athabascan peoples, which is kind of mind-blowing in a way um, to think that there was two Athabascan migrations in, the, in this one area. Just a little aside for you. So people uh, in this basin follow a similar seasonal life way. I mean, they had an amazing, you know, oak savanna to, uh, they had lots of camas in the area, great soils, large mountains to protect themselves, um, a good river basin. I mean, the uh, fishing on the, on the Umpqua is, is an amazing experience. Um, 
and there is numerous tribal villages uh, along this river. Um, this is one of the areas that the, the, the Hudson's Bay traders placed a fur trading fort uh, called Fort Umqua. And so they had a lot of later on fur trade. Um, what's interesting is even though there was so much activity in this basin, not really much is known about the peoples. And so at some point in the future, I'll be writing more essays about them. I have a good number of essays in my blog already, but um, it's a pr pretty amazing basin for uh, a great diversity of different tribal peoples. Um, and I, if you want to see these, the treaties that, that for these peoples in the basin, you can go to um, uh, the, the three treaties of the tribes on my blog site. Um, the Cow Creek Band, actually, I think go on to my next, yeah, the Cow Creek Band had their own uh, early treaty in 1853 um, because they were kind of a sort of violent tribe at the time. And they also had their own reservation set up in the Cow Creek Basin, which nobody has pictured on any map anywhere. anywhere. I had to sort of create it out of their description. But um, they remained on this reservation in their own area until 1856 when they were moved to uh, Grand Ronde as well, along with the Umpqua um, Valley uh, removal of tribes. And so I, I would like to see you know, more work done on, on what that reservation was like because I don't ever see it on any maps anywhere. Uh, um, it's a pretty amazing situation. This is the map we have of the Umpqua Reservation was in the valley, the other Umpqua Reservation. Um, and I have, again, essays about this. Um, essentially, it was a holding spot for about almost a year, uh, maybe two years for some tribes, um, uh, for the Umpquas, the Malala people, the Kalapuyas, um, and that's where they uh, that's where they lived, um, and Malala's were added very late. They were only oh, were maybe a month, um, but they were continually being attacked by the settlers in the area who really kind of wanted their land, who kind of, you know, were not satisfied they had everything else and, and wanted their that piece of land as well. And so there are lots of stories in the basin of, of the Umpqua people getting attacked for really no reason. And so it's an interesting situation in itself. They were also removed to Grand Ronde, like I said, and they lived in this upper portion next to this river. The, um, the, this K-L-M-N-O was the Umpqua camps. And the ones down here on the bottom were the Rogue River camps down here. So I've already talked about these things. So back a little bit to um, tribal culture. So the tribes um, in the region all had a history, the cultures of setting fires and of managing their land, stewarding their land, if you will. Um, when, that, when the tribal fires stopped, uh, when settlers stopped them from doing this anymore, um, about 30 or 40 years later, we started to see massive burns in the region. And so one example of this is the Tillamook burn which really took off in the early 20th century, went into about 18, 1951. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of acres burned in the Tillamook area, mainly because they stopped, we, you know, the Americans stopped burning in the area. So the, the, the fuel levels rose and to the point where when there was a fire, a couple of fires, it destroyed everything. <laughs> so that's where we're at today. Um, that, um, the reason why there's so many amazing fires, um, catastrophic fires in our area that, is because we haven't been managing the forest right and like the tribal people had did it before. I mean, they knew that in order to keep a stable, productive landscape that they had to set fires. And so there are a lot of movements right now to think about moving back to a point where we are, again, properly managing our environment because otherwise it's gonna be a huge tinderbox for some time. Um, so we have also lots of food technologies that we want to return to. A lot of folks want to begin, again, eating the traditional foods. We'd like to sort of work on that. We're working on ways of doing that right now, tries to restoring their knowledge of food systems uh, and finding out ways, you know, we could perhaps return to, return to a healthy diet. Things like acorns, camas, wapato, and berries and other root plants perhaps have real good benefits for, you know, our, our health. Um, 
you know, and, and these are projects we're working on today, kind of because we, um, that, you know, traditional knowledge was, was assimilated out of us for generations. And so we, we basically lost our ability, our, our, our knowledge of these things. And now the tribes are saying, wait a minute, you know, we should go back to that again. That was a better way of living than, than today. So we're working on that right now. So, but when we work with environmentalists on these things, we work with uh, people who want to restore landscapes. Um, um, a lot of environmentalists tend to want to take from us. They just want their, they want the knowledge, they don't want the people. And so what we're saying is the, is the, the knowledge is not useful unless you bring the culture and the people with it. You know, we, you know, our peoples lived these lands for tens of thousands of years, perhaps. And we have the knowledge in our oral histories, in our culture, to live pro properly with this land, uh, what's, called, what's called TEK nowadays, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and so you can't just take that from us. You have to include us in that, in that project. And so there are lots of, of folks right now getting on board with that and inviting us into projects. And so, and this is a, um, a great need we have to be involved in these things and to help people understand what they're reading in the books and and what they're trying to to uh, uh, what they're trying to do with their environmental activism. One of the things I uh, I have a here's a picture of that woodpecker tree. I took a picture of it. It's pretty amazing. You know they implant literally acorns into the tree and come back and eat them later. Probably this is this is their storage bin for the winter. You know exactly. So. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of environmental restoration projects, and sometimes they invite me in, saying they want to, you know, restore an oak savanna. But I, I'm asking them, you know, what are you going to use that for? You know, what are you going to do with it? To what end are you doing this? You know, because we only reason we had oak savannas is for food. We didn't we didn't want to uh, create a picturesque landscape because we want we like living in it. You know, we made it for food for using for using it. So. Um, I'm working with organizations saying, let's use this landscape. Let's, let's, de let's devise a philosophy where we actually interact with that landscape like we did as Native people in the past, where we respect it and, and steward it you know, for the future, for the, for the seven generations in the future, or whatever you want to say, what do you say about that? But let's do that. And we are starting to get some headway in that project. So um, I, I, I encourage you to do the same thing in your, your area as much as you can. And I wanna say goodbye, um, thank you at the Kalapuya greeting of thank you. So goodbye. That, that's, that's all the screen shares I have. <laughs> so I guess I'm open for questions. Um, I'll stop the sharing. Thank you so much, David. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have some questions in the question and answer area. So one question is, what year did the Athabascan invade the Tacoma people? You know, I don't think anybody knows for sure. I know he was there with the camera looking at, at them, but um, the, the, the theory is something like 12, between 12,000 and, and 16,000 years ago, or no, 100 years ago, sorry. 1200 and 1600 years ago. So that's a very more recent migration. There's a the migration story comes of the Talwa people, um, them landing on the coast and them saying they came from the sort of frozen north. So we know there are a lot of Athabascan tribes in, in, in what's now called British Columbia and even Canada. So clearly there, there's a possibility that that could be a true story. Can I interject something there, David, on that? Sure. Um, when I was in Alaska, I journeyed to the village of Northway, um, Alaska, which is in the uh, small territory that narrows down just as it goes into the Yukon Territory of Canada. Um, in that area are the Copper and Chitna rivers. And the Tlingit people came to the Copper Center area and mined copper from the mountains there to make their potlatch shields that were used in their uh, massive celebrations and giveaways. Um, the chief from that village, uh, Walter Northway, told a story there um, one night when uh, we were there doing a dance presentation, and he said that they used to have the big drum in that village, and that we, 
he hadn't seen it or had it there for many generations and that it had traveled south with the people who hmm. came from Tanana and Nenana up the Tanana River uh, where the headwaters of the Tanana River are located close to Northway and that those people had traveled with their Clinket trading partners out to the coast and then proceeded down the west coast in their canoes um, which might possibly account for um, the fact that there is yellow cedar growing only in one area in the, the Klamath Knot, and that would be right around the area of the rat hole at Agnes. Hmm. Um, and that that's really um, quite an interesting piece about how that might have gotten there uh, during that period of time as well. Yeah, that's great. That's a great story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of Athabascan people, another question was, were the Athabascans related to the Athabascans in interior Alaska? Um, I think that's, I mean, when you say Athabascan, it's a language group, uh, so language family. So yeah, I mean, technically they're all interrelated peoples. Thank you. Um, before we go too much further with questions, and while we have the majority of attendees still here, I would like to just mention that this uh, will, this is being recorded. Um, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, also, David, there was some question about um, viewing the presentation slides. Would those be available somehow? Or are they on your blog site? Um, well, I think you've taped this, so you can talk to Lisa about that. But um, so I'm, I'm assuming part of the presentation will include the slides. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. This is nodding. Okay. okay, I'll put my. Much of this information is also my blog um, in, in a scattered number of um, uh, essays. So I'll put my blog site URL into the chat. And Lisa, can you link our YouTube channel in the chat, please? And I also just wanted to mention that um, beyond a land acknowledgement, you know, we gave a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this program, but I just wanted to recognize that you know, for all of you attending, you know, this is going beyond a land acknowledgement to actively learn about the history of Oregon and Native people. And if you would like to continue to move, you know, beyond a land acknowledgement, um, other ways, you know, that you can recognize Native people is to invite presenters to your school or to your um, organization. Um, you can also donate to Native organizations. Um, so that is also directly, you know, acknowledging the Native and current, you know, people that live on this land. And to move back to the questions, uh, one question was, is there any place to find the maps that you had in your presentation, David? Yeah, you have to, you have to be me. <laughs> no, I have a lot of my blog site. <laughs> I'm not willing to share my my maps. I do it all on my maps. It's a it's a, a Google uh, app. Um, you can anybody can do it. Um, so uh, it's free, and I just like take a, a screenshot of 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 a piece of the map. But um, I, I use the maps in, all, in most of my blogs and I create, I, I actually make the maps because um, I don't have to pay a, a royalties to some other map maker somewhere else. So um, so I make it up myself, I do it myself. Um, and so the blog has many of them where it needs it. So there you go. Thank you. Um, another question was, what was the role of fire in managing acorns and canvas? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, clearly, uh, I know there's been studies in California about uh, fire, about how oaks are, are fire resistant, uh, but they're also reactive to fire. It, uh, um, apparently, studies have suggested that more acorns, more acorns are produced if uh, after a fire episode. So, um, um, and clearly, things like root crops are. Um, resistant to fire because they're underground. So if you have a what they call a cool burn, a, a, a regular fire that comes through a valley, it'll burn off the top, you know, the root crops underground, the tubers and stuff like that are going to survive. So clearly that's um, helpful, you know, to uh, to those plants by eliminating competitors, eliminating weeds, eliminating too many insects, pests, things like that. Um, and, and it's maybe maybe part of the reason why root crops are so popular to try is because they survive fire. You know, uh, in, in, uh, I don't know what the other part of the question was, berries, what was it? 
uh, role in fire of managing acorns and canvas? Yeah, so I think that's it. Um, um, I don't, I don't know if we've done enough enough studies of um, the effects of fire on camas to really tell you, you know, whether what the if the nutrients that are deposited in the soil is helpful to camas or not. I think that you can sort of logically figure out that um, by the elimination of competitors, by elimination of um, uh, you know too many pests, too many insects. Um, um, you're creating a better environment, and then and then clearly nutrients deposited in the soil from fires are is is helpful to some plants too. I don't know if you've done any kind of studies on on exactly how helpful it is to canvas though. Thank you for that. Um, I do know I believe I want to say Margot Robbie from I think Krug or Yurok um, through the Trex program in California they have started to do cultural burning, and so they're also another resource to learn about cultural burning history. Um, let's see here. Another question is, um, do you have any idea of how the treaties were negotiated with the language barrier? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Chinook Wawa was a very um, well-known language for the area. And even if it wasn't fully used in, in the South, um, people knew some words. Um, so I think Chinook Wawa is a, is a good suspect for a uh, common language everybody could use. Um, I know that um, Palmer and the Army and, and others would hire um, people that knew language that knew the languages too. So you could hire somebody that knew, I don't know, Chinook and Tacoma or something. And then and because the, there's lots of folks, lots of native people knew, you know, upwards of five, 10 languages. So uh, we were kind of our own, you know, you know, uh, translator. So, um, you know, uh, in some ways, that's a better way of living than, than with one language your whole life. Thank you. Another question is, why was the town of Tacoma between Grants Pass and the coast named that as in Tacoma? Um, always heard it was connected to the Tacoma Tacoma peoples having an encampment or village there. You know, I haven't looked at that exact history. I think that um, or geographic place names may have that in the, the book may have that. Um, but I haven't looked at that exact incidence of Tacoma. I mean, they may have had a camp there, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you know about what time period the Lakota tribes and the Rogue Valley tribes were working together? The Lakota tribes? Mm -hmm. That's what's written down. And the, and the Rogue Valley tribes? Mm -hmm. um, I post 1890, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know of any. <laughs> Probably today. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I don't Thursday. know. <laughs> Whenever they allowed the Lakotas off the reservation, I guess. I, I, um, <laughs> after, after, okay, I got it. After, after 1924, <laughs> we became citizens in 1924. So after that, I, I don't. I've never heard of any other connection between Lakotas and and Rogue Rivers. So I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, you know, I have to say, I love how when you get more than two Indians together, you just start laughing. <laughs> Questions we have. <laughs> no, I would say after 1924, when everybody was allowed off the reservations, mm. I don't know what the first me uh, meeting, maybe, you know, I know there was a number of meetings through like uh, football and basketball before that. So maybe ba baseball or something, but. There were a number of folks that traveled around and played sports and stuff, and but I don't know of any kind of intertribal meetings or anything before that. It uh, looks like we have about maybe 10 more minutes or so for questions, um, and then we'll wrap up to stay on time, which is something Natives are not always the best at doing, but we're going to do that today. Um, can you, one question is, can you teach us how to pronounce kapai? The word you used at the end of your presentation? Like, just like you did it. <laughs> there you go. I think it's actually, uh, I keep on being talked with, uh, to by um, Esther Stutzman, who's kind of an elder in the area. Uh, it, it's not 
Kapai, it's Kapai. So I'm like, okay. Okay. I'll try and get it better. Kapai. Kapai. Okay. Um, another question is, can you describe the overlap of the bands or peoples now confederated in the tribes of Siletz and Grand Ronde? Um, well, you know, I, I don't know if the U.S. military really cared, uh, U.S. government really cared who moved where as long as they were on reservations. Um, uh, I think, you know, the stories I get from my elders are that the, the that Shasta got, I mean, the, that Siletz got most of the coastal peoples and Grand Ronde got most of the inland peoples, uh, which is pretty much true, except for the sort of Southern Oregon peoples. Um, they were kind of split between the two reservations. Um, so I would say that, you know, there's not a real rhyme or reason. And then, and then in the meantime, um, after the, the initial settlement of the reservations, there were lots of intermarriages between the two. Um, so we do have, you know, um, names that are on both reservations, like names like uh, Lino and Mercier and Hudson and Dowd. And, and there's lots of other names that are now on both reservations because people are intermarried. So, but the initial movements uh, were mostly coastal, went to uh, coast reservation, and then mostly inland peoples like the Calipuyans uh, went to um, um, Grand Ron, and then there was a split um, in 1857 between the two, the two uh, like Umquas and you know, mostly mostly um, Shastas and Tecalmas uh, between the two. Thank you. It's confusing, I know. <laughs> that's part of that's part of the of the of the the challenge of doing research in Oregon is it is so diverse and confusing uh, to anybody that you know just wants to spend five minutes learning about it. Uh, you really have to spend years thinking about it and learning about it to really get it. Yeah. Let's see here. Another question is: Are there books by Native people about wild foods and preparation for Oregon? Oh yeah, I mean, there's one right now. Um, Patty, uh, we're at Phillips has a book out, Ethnobotany of the Coos, uh, which is pretty good. Um, um, there's some, I think there's some information in in um, George and George Aguilar's book on you know when the when the river ran wild when the river ran wild, mm -hmm. which re relates to the mostly the Warm Springs people. Um, there's some information in. When days go by, which relates to the uh, Umatilla people, um, I think that I think, but I think Phil the Phil's book is is number one, I would say, and then uh, I think Dewar's book, which was mentioned somewhere in some blog somewhere in the chat, I think, um, is actually pretty good too. He's worked with tribes all throughout the region, and so I think his book's going to be perfect too. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Another question is, does colonist fire suppression and land use threaten the range of Madrone, Manzanita, and their dependent species? Uh, I don't think, I think humans are the biggest threat. I think that you know, human expansion into wildlands is, is like the number one threat, I would say. And then the human mismanagement of the wildlands is the, is the, is the big threat too. So I think I would say humans are the bigger threat. Yes. Uh, another question is, um, are there efforts to restore native place names to the landscape? Um, yeah, there's a number of efforts, um, you know, like we, like you guys have had down there in the Ashland area, the, the, the change from Dead Indian Road to Lagawa place names. Um, hopefully you guys put some pressure on your, your county commissioners to, to change the road. That's, def that's desperately needed. Um, we don't need any more Dead Indians in the area. Um, but there's lots of, we've been doing these squaw replacements, squaw place name replacements all throughout Oregon. It ta actually takes quite a bit of research. I have, I think three or four or up to five place names in Southern Oregon I'm working on, um, but I have to get the right tribe. And, and the problem is, you know, um, I, I try and work within the language as much as possible. Um, uh, and, 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 and I'm not a fluent, you know, linguist. So it takes me a while to sort of figure it all out. Um, but, um, but I think the, the appropriate place names should not just be anything we can think of in our minds, but, but based on the original tribes that live there in their language as much as possible. So I'm working on that, you know, we've done a few good ones. Um, 
and uh, we'll probably do more. So. I do know, yes, we have not been successful in changing uh, the name of the road yet, although we have been successful recently in changing some, uh, I think, waterway names um, to Lotgawa Creek or Lotgawa Spring, I believe. Um, and I believe up in Alaska, they've been successful in changing some of the city names to uh, the names of the people's place for that area. Well, McKinley, McKinley to, to Denali was a good change. Yes. Hopefully that gives us a good uh, blueprint if, if anybody knows about that to perhaps working on McLaughlin or you know other other places and stuff. Uh, one of the questions was if uh, that if you know some of the original names for Mount McLaughlin. Well, th that's a big problem, and we do know um, we do have some names from the Tacoma people, but then you have the people from the other side that the you know the the Klamath people that have their own names. So. Um, I think you're going to have um, to do some negotiating and, and to figure out what that means. Um, can it have two names? Um, there is, you know, a lot of place names can have historic names that are thrown in there too, so you can actually have two different names. Or, or do you want to, I mean, there are things, like, I mean, there's places on, on McLaughlin which re need to be renamed, like they have North Squatit and, and South Squatit or something like that. I'm like, come on, really? And so, so the, those desperately need need to be renamed too. Um, I th I would think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean that's there are no names. We just need to uh, work on that. I mean, it's a little bit more of a project to rename a mountain when 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 it's when it's perhaps uh, a place for two two or two or more different tribes than some than um, than I guess Denali was. Thank you. Um, another question is, are there museums with exhibits on Native American tribes of Southern Oregon? Uh, you guys used to have the Southern Oregon Museum there, right? Southern Oregon Historical Museum? Yes, it's been, uh, it's been inactive for a number of years. Um, we had a Native program there that was uh, teaching school children um, the uh, history that we had uh, and doing demonstrations of um, the kinds of skills used for survival. And uh, apparently it didn't, um, it still didn't set well with the board of directors for the museum. And so they shut down the program and just shortly after that, they shut down the museum. I don't know what their plans are, uh, but uh, there are certainly a, quite a large number of uh, artifacts still in their possession. This was also at the old, uh, the museum in Jacksonville, which was the old courthouse where the Indian people were hung on a regular basis. Well, I, I've, I've actually toured both of those locations. Um, you know, I think that there's good reason to, 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 to try to restart one of them. I would hope, though, that some of the, you know, recent work on, on multi-narrative displays, uh, more accurate representations of native peoples would be a part of any kind of project that, that tries to, to get them going again. Yes. I think the only one really operative right now that's fairly large is the Douglas County Museum. Um, it's got a pretty good collection and, and I don't know, I haven't seen excellent displays there. I mean, they have a small display area, but, but they do have pretty good archives. Uh, it looks like Lisa, there's another uh, request for the YouTube link in the chat, if you may. Well, thank you, David. I see that we are approaching the end of our time. Um, I think we really appreciate your time and energy you've given to us today and all the resources uh, you've provided with us, um, as well as, you know, taking all this time to answer questions. So just wanted to give you such a big thank you. And Lisa, did you want to say anything? No? OK. <laughs> well, thank you. This is great. I, I enjoyed it. Um, gives me an opportunity to practice some of the things I've been reading about and, uh, and thinking about. And um, thank you very much. Yes. And there's so much, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a lot of thank yous in the chat, uh, David, for your Yeah, they're going, they're going nuts in there, so. <laughs> Good question, brother. Thank you. Saving. Thanks a lot. I am saving a copy of the chat. We've had requests for that, for the recordings of this and our prior two lectures. 
and I'm part-time and, and learning the technology, but we are getting them posted ASAP and we'll send the links out everywhere. Thank Great. You. Um, yeah, send me a link to this uh, video when you get it up. I can I can link it at the university stuff. Yeah, for I, I use these as sort of training tools for my next class and stuff. So I, I make the students watch it. So. <laughs> 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 thank you very much it is hard to turn off but thank you everybody good night good night i don't let the chat messages come in That went very well. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the numbers kept growing. Uh, the answer lies in the expansion. Lies in expansion. Lies in expansion. That's tonight, tonight at 10 on the DN on OPB. I was this is fresh air. This is fresh I'm Terry Gross. Let's get back to my interview with Linda Villarosa. She's a contributor to the New York Times Magazine, and her latest article in the magazine is titled Black Lives Are Shorter in Chicago. My Family's History Shows Why. She